Lameness is the number one cause of sport horse and race horse retirement. That's why it's so important. Um, many lamenesses are of a chronic or progressive nature, such as osteoarthritis or ones involving soft tissue injury. Um, but today's focus or talk will um, focus on acute problems requiring prompt intervention and first aid. So there's several different reasons why we might have an acute lameness. Um, sometimes they're quite obvious and you see that with, you know, large uh, skin wounds. Sometimes they're fractures with acute lameness. Um, sometimes they're lame with those fractures and sometimes they're not lame. Sometimes they have swelling and sometimes there's no swelling. So it can be quite interesting at times. Um, acute lameness, one of the most common ones here is our abscesses in the foot. Um, infection can be seen. So if they have cellulitis in the limb or lymphangitis, um, definitely they can be quite involved. Uh, foreign bodies in the foot, sometimes it's just, you know, they've stepped on a nail um, and we want to make sure we're identifying those quickly as well. Laminitis is a debilitating problem. Unfortunately, it's far too common. Um, does anyone deal with laminitis here with any of their horses? Yeah, it's just awful. Um, and I have neurological in here as well, and I really think that there's a fine line between lameness and neurological problems sometimes. So we're not going to dwell on that, but I really just thought that I'd indicate that just so people are keeping that in the back of their mind as well. So wounds. Location is certainly important. Whether or not we've uh, jeopardized a tendon sheath, that there's a laceration in that area, or over a joint. Um, we want to know the duration of the wound, you know, is this something that's just happened or is it um, something that's been going on for a week or two? And then surgery an option. We really would like to have all wounds healed by first intention and that's where we actually suture those um, skin edges closed so that it heals by first intention. Um, secondary intention is where we're not able to suture it for whatever reason. Maybe the wound's too old or there's just not enough skin to close it. And then that uh, wound will heal in with what is normal, granulation tissue. Um, it's when it becomes excessive granulation tissue. That's what we refer to as proud flesh. So uh, we do try our best to reduce the incidence of proud flesh. And proud flesh is one of the, uh, those things that's fairly unique to the horse. Uh, we don't see it as much in other species, but the horse is just a reactive species to begin with. And any wounds lower than the hock or lower than the carpus or otherwise known as the, uh, the knee um, are definitely susceptible to it. So just to show you a couple of examples, we have the inside aspect of the hock here off to the left. That's just over the lower hock joints. So we'd certainly be concerned that maybe one of the lower hock joints was jeopardized with this wound. Sometimes we'll go in and sample the, the joint, usually away from the wound, so we're not passing a needle through an already infected area. In the middle picture here, we have a heel bulb laceration. So that's very close, um, possibly communicating with the coffin joint or the navicular bursa located at the back of the foot here. And here we have a carpus, so horses commonly go down on their knees. It's a very shallow joint, so we do have to be careful that we're not entering the joint uh, in cases of carpal abrasions. Here's a hay feeder injury. So obviously this is not a new wound or, you know, an hour old. Um, it's been there for a little bit. Um, so several hours duration, um, but I don't know if you can appreciate it but there's a, a large skin defect, probably about three inches by three inches here. So we're right over a joint. That wound is not gonna be closed up with first intention. We can try all we want, it's just not gonna happen. So uh, in this particular case, we used a regenerative therapy. Um, we used something called platelet-rich fibrinogen. Um, and what we did was we used the horse's own blood and prost it, processed it and uh, once the, the area was all debrided up, we injected it along the skin edge and then actually made a bandage using the gel form of this um, and then wrapped it up. And we did that because we were really trying to um, reduce the risk of having to do a skin graft you know, in the future. 
So this is the, the same wound here under the general, and it's all debrided, giving it a, a good chance to heal nicely. And this is the kit here that we're using. It's relatively new. It's uh, platelet-rich fibrinogen. Again, it, you're using the horse's own blood for that. Flamazine is a great product that I like. If any of you want to know um, my secrets for Proud Flush, um, I usually use a combination of flamazine for one day, and then the second day I'll apply a 1% hydrocortisone uh, cream, and uh, I can't say I've had any cases where it didn't work successfully. Compliments of Dr. Yu. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the same leg one month later. I think this looks wonderful. So you've got a nice, uh, healthy bed of granulation tissue here. And there's nothing extending over the skin edge. So uh, we're not dealing with any proud flush. So it should allow those skin edges to come together nicely. And it has, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the most recent uh, picture of it. But healing is dependent on so many different things too. So you want to be controlling infection. This horse definitely was kept on some self antibiotics long term. Um, you can use topical treatments, like I said, the flamazine and hydrocortisone are great um, options. Um, again, there's individual variation of how quickly it is going to heal and controlling proud flesh, especially for wounds below the hawk and the carpus. Like I said, we did use a regenerative therapy in this case, but also shockwave treatment is another form of uh, regenerative treatment because it actually stimulates uh, the stem cells locally to come in and heal that tissue. And I know that Dr. Judith Koenig from the Ontario Veterinary College has done some research on uh, healing skin wounds using shockwave treatment. So we see the wounds. We know why the horse is lame. Sometimes we don't have that obvious wound. So in the non-weight-bearing lameness, what can it be? So it could be a fracture, an abscess, an infection, lymphangitis. Lymphangitis is usually pretty easy to detect because it's a very large swollen limb. Uh, could it be a foreign body in the foot? So the history is so important. You know, has this horse just raced? You know, was the horse out in the paddock with others? You know, could have been kicked. Was the horse in his stall, came in from the paddock fine and was found this way the following morning? Um, how is that horse being used? Maybe what discipline of sport does it actually participate in? You know, is there any swelling anywhere? Is there any fever? You wanna look at that foot and make sure that you're not missing a foreign body. And that can be sneaky sometimes if it's deeply embedded in there. So I have a couple of videos here to show you. And uh, this is a young uh, thoroughbred filly. She had raced the previous day, had done quite well. And she came like first or second, so she performed exceptionally well. She came back to the farm to be turned out later that afternoon. And uh, the following morning, this is what we found. So this horse actually, she's young, she's fractious, she wouldn't let you near that leg. Um, there wasn't any obvious swelling. Um, but she was actually walking almost like a string halt um, walk. So that hind right would come up very quickly and then slam down. And, uh, you know, I, it was to the point where I thought this is really odd. And I actually called Dr. John Baird from the Ontario Veterinary College and said, you know, I don't know if, if this is really string halt or not. It turned out to be an abscess. What? Yeah. So. No heat in the foot, no pulse, um, no swelling. And so ever since then, I have this new saying that it's an abscess until proven otherwise. <laughs> I've been humbled quite a bit in the last 20 years. Um, I've had some abscesses last as long as seven or eight weeks. And to the point where you start second guessing yourself and thinking, well, maybe I have missed a fraction. You'll go back and you'll x-ray again just to be sure. And then with the recent race history, I thought we'd better be ruling out a coffin bone fracture or a P1 fracture. You know, certainly see that a ton of it in the standard breads. Um, but, uh, and there's usually no swelling. So foreign bodies. So what do you do if you get, a, you know, you find a foreign body in your horse's foot, and I'm thinking about the foot more than any other part of the body at this point in time. But you want to take a photo, maybe take a photo at several different angles. 
Um, and if at all possible, you want to leave the foreign body in, such as if there's a nail in the foot, um, so that we can take radiographs when we come out and actually determine what structures could have possibly been involved. If it's that deep, or if really we went into some less vital structures, then we might not get as concerned, okay? And that's not always the, you know, an option to just leave it in place, but if you think you can, the horse is calm, then it makes sense, um, especially if the veterinarian is able to get out there promptly, okay? You certainly want to know the tetanus status of the horse. Um, if it hasn't had tetanus, you know, in the last little bit, make sure that, uh, you know, you're getting the booster done for that. We can get wood foreign bodies. You can see a shard of wood here in uh, this foot. This went right through the, um, the coronet band. Um, luckily, it was not in the coffin joint, um, but actually extended down about two more inches, believe it or not. So uh, unfortunately, you cannot x-ray wood. It's not going to show up. And if there's air in there, ultrasounding is not going to be much help either. It's going to be definitely trickier. Um, in this particular case, we did remove the wood, watch the horse quite closely. Um, we did tap that coffin joint just to be sure. We tapped it on the other side here and it, everything looked good. But another option if we thought that it was jeopardized is there's a treatment called um, regional limb perfusion where we actually apply a tourniquet, just usually about the level of the fetlock. The tourniquet is left on for about 30 minutes while we put through a little butterfly catheter just a little bit lower on the leg, usually just under the fetlock, and we infuse about 50 mils of a dilute um, antibiotic. So that way that antibiotic is being concentrated just to that specific area, rather than just going through the whole body, okay? We'll do the regional limb perfusion treatment every 48 hours, usually for about three treatments, okay? Um, definitely worthwhile for any foreign bodies in the foot. And not that this is really a foreign body, this is a needle that's been directed into the navicular bursa. This is just to show you, you know, what it would look like if there was a nail, you know, actually into the foot. Lymphangitis. Lymphangitis or cellulitis, you know, they're very painful um, infections in the horse. In the case of lymphangitis, this is usually something where it's a sudden um, hind limb swelling don't see it in the front limb. I'm not sure why, but it's always the hind limb. Usually bigger horses that I've seen it into. Um, but they're fracture lame, very painful. Um, often that the skin is so tight that it oozes serum through the skin. Okay. Um, sometimes you get skin folds. It almost looks like elephant skin just because it's just so inflamed. Um, but unfortunately, it's a very intensive, expensive antibiotic treatment. And once they've had one bout of lymphangitis, they uh, have a high rate of recurrence, unfortunately. So uh, it can be pretty upsetting for the owner. Um, but prevention is key, you know. Um, once they've had it, you really do need to watch them closely if they have any flare-ups. Keep them out of the tall grass that has dew on it. So anything wet, you know, after you've bathed them, you know, make sure you're drying those pasterns off well. It's just the, the wetness seems to trigger it. And uh, it's just something that we don't know a whole lot about at this point in time, but um, does require some pretty intensive treatment. Laminitis. This hits more of a personal note here. This is uh, my own little pony here. He's about 25. And um, laminitis here, you've got typically a rocking horse stance, especially if it's an acute, uh, severe form of it. So the horse will actually stand with its front legs sticking out. It might rock back so that its hind legs are underneath the body trying to get its weight off the front limbs. Um, you can just imagine how painful it is. It's um, inflammation of the lamella that actually holds the hoof on top of the, um, the last bone in the horse's foot, the coffin bone. So you imagine all that weight, horse's weight, is dependent on these little structures, okay? So it's incredible how strong they are when they are healthy, but if they get inflamed, it's just incredible pain for them. It can happen in all four feet. It can happen in just the hind, but um, most commonly it happens in both front feet. So it can be due to several different things. It can be due to infection. So if you've got a mare that's retained her placenta and it wasn't uh, treated properly, even sometimes with proper treatment it happens. 
Uh, if you've sent a horse in for colic surgery, um, they do certainly want to watch them closely after that they're not developing laminitis because of the, um, the, any infection that might have gone on during that uh, time. Um, it can be because of road founder or trauma, um, metabolics. If you have insulin resistance or Cushing's disease, um, usually those are your easy keepers. They tend to be, you know, in their mid-teens or older, or you might not even have a fat horse, but it has fat deposits that are very obvious, you know, right over the gluteals or the shoulder region, you know. They might not even be fat across the ribs, but they might have the crusty neck as well. So some br breeds certainly are um, more commonly affected. Ponies are notorious. Usually they say there's two types of ponies, right? One that's foundered and one that's going to, <laughs> right? Um, Arabs. Arabs are, you know, they've got the crusty neck typically. Not all of them, but again, they're easier um, doers than that. Morgans, we see it a fair bit in them too, okay? But um, anyway, so you do the blood testing on your, your older horse that might be drinking a little bit more, urinating more than usual should be tested. Um, steroids have been implicated as uh, a problem, so your dexamethasone or your steroid joint injections. Um, in my eyes, I think if they're used um, properly, they're great drugs. Uh, I think you can abuse anything, and I have only can remember one horse that I've uh, done a joint injection on that did come up a little bit foot sore shortly after and was fine after that. but. Uh, um, it is certainly known to potentially cause or increase the risk of laminitis. So laminitis, what can you do for them? It's nice to know about it, but what can we do as well? So you want to keep the horse quiet so there's no walking. You can ice the feet. You can hang a hay net uh, so the horse doesn't need to carry its weight on its front feet. Um, deeply bedded is really nice too. Okay, some people will go to the extreme of actually bringing in sand because it is supposed to be very supportive of the foot, but it's obviously not an easy thing to be doing either. So, know your shaving source. So, if you're bedding on um, your shavings, you want to make sure it's always uh, softwood shavings, not hardwood shavings. There was an incident in the Guelph area where. Uh, um, they were ordering in softwood shavings and several horses came up foot sore and they determined that they're you know, suffering laminitis and when you have that many horses affected you have to go to the common denominator so um, certainly it was softwood but uh, they called in the owner of the company just to make sure and he actually did identify that there was some hardwood component in it and there was some black walnut. So only softwoods and monitor your paddocks, okay? Again, for your fallen branches, things like that. Choose your steroid use carefully. They're very useful when they're used properly, okay? I know a lot of people don't like using bute, and I always say bute's a great drug. It's inexpensive as long as we're using it wisely, okay? Calling the veterinarian about radiographs, uh, doing some blood work if it's metabolic, pain medications, uh, therapeutic shoeing, there's all sorts of different possible treatments and making sure you're looking after those infections. So lameness, you want to call the veterinarian to discuss what you are seeing and determine is this an actual emergency or is this something that can wait a day or two. Take some photos or videos, we all have, most of us have those cameras now with our phones so I get a slew of photos sent to me and I do love it. Sometimes you can't appreciate everything on them, but it's certainly helpful, especially in determining if it's something that I need to drop what I'm doing and get out there, or if it's something that I can schedule maybe for the following day. General cold therapy. I mean, you can't go wrong with cold therapy, right? Cold water or ice for swelling is just a great first aid. And again, the history use, um, was it recently exercised, you know, turnout, previous medical problems. A good history is 90% of the diagnosis, I say, okay? And I love the, the saying, common things occur commonly too. I mean, sometimes there's some really weird, obscure problems, um, and those make life a little bit more interesting sometimes, but um, again, common things do occur commonly.